Okay, welcome back to the Saving Science video series. In the last installment, uh, we focused on universities and we I recounted stories of university incentives that are not aligned with scientific principles you learn in high school related to transparency and replication. And we got increasingly concerned and the professors seemed lukewarm at best interested in our push for raising standards. And it seemed weird, it seemed like there was kind of a lack of accountability, though I didn't see it that way at the time. But we just forged ahead anyways and then got increasingly concerned as we talked to other residents in other departments at conferences. And it did kind of seem, at least retroactively, that there was some impending disaster that would happen. And, and sure enough, uh, it, it did in the form of Daryl Ben's bomb. And then the fraud cases, several new ones we will mention today. And, but then it was exciting times. And so last time we ended on a very positive note because it was, it was really an exciting time to think about what will happen. Will BAM's effects, paranormal effects actually replicate or not, then what it what does it mean for the the standards in the field? And there was already people working on several initiatives, both in the transparency direction and separately in the replication dimension. And yeah, it was it was so it was initially embarrassing and 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 kind of upsetting, but. Overall, it was positive, and again, especially for us, because we had been misaligned or maligned and, and mocked for being perfectionists and wanting overly high standards. But then all of a sudden, we were seen as uh, being on the right side of, of history, I guess, and kind of predicting this in this ironic way and so the but the broader story arch here is that humans are biased which is why the scientific method was invented in the first place i started grad school i saw problems almost immediately but usually my concerns i would i would put them aside or the advisor would have reasons and sometimes they weren't convincing, but you're busy and you want to achieve. So you're just um, continuing trying to do your best. But then I realized that there's so much at stake and the, the, there's never been kind of a worse time to be an academic scientist in the sense of the high stakes, the hyper competition. And so this means it's never been more important to get back to the basics of transparency and replication. But we were being trained in direct contradiction to that. And so trained to oversell evidence, to suppress laws with the study, and all kinds of strange things. But again, it made sense at the time because psychology is complicated. That was also part of, I think, the self-deception is 
we use the true fact. So it is a true fact. And I think even Richard Feynman admitted this, that the psychological phenomena are just inherently substantially more complex and nuanced than physical matter in physics. And, and our tools are less well-developed and more crude, right? And, and that's a lethal combination. And so whenever we were doing things that seemed questionable, a common defense and justification, well, we're doing our best. Psychology is incredibly complex. So, and, and it's, people seem convinced by that argument. And I wasn't so sure. And I remember specifically with one of my close friends who I later had a falling out with because, well, we'll get to some examples. We just couldn't agree. And I thought it was unethical what he's doing. And he, of course, that's upsetting. But, you know, there was basically no way. Though this touches upon another part of the story is that for most people, uh, their friendships and their relationships are more important than principles, like scientific principles. But for me, I guess, it was the other way around. My principles were more important than my friendships. And it was sad when, well, we'll see. I don't want to tip too much off from the story. But I, I, there were social ramifications to my courageous actions, I guess. But I was ready to accept that, whereas most people, I guess, wouldn't. And um, so that's the overall story arch. And, and today it's going to be a lot of some positive, uh, but things will take a turn. And so we will we will continue with and kind of review the positive. Let's go back. Oh, no, it's not really. Um, transparency initiatives and replication initiatives. And again, it was very exciting. But, but we soon realized that not everyone was on board, which was very shocking because at the time we were very naive, I guess, which again is ironic given we were social psychologists who were thrown into a social psychological situation by Daryl Bam's bomb. And we thought, well, we'll just improve standards over here. In terms of transparency standards, we'll improve the culture surrounding replication. People will change their behavior. And we'll go back. We can get back to doing research, and, and, and which is the fun part. But we quickly realized that we were completely wrong. <laughs> and um, and so the first incident, yeah, I'll I'll just skip. I'll go straight to the incidents because we can save time. So the replication movement. Um, well, there was the Open Science Collaboration, led by Brian Nosek, which was formed around December 2011. 2011, rather. Or, wait. Yeah, fall 2011. And it aimed to 
to do a major project called the reproducibility project. And so there, and this was a kind of a unprecedented large scale effort to do as many replication of important findings. But so there was already grumblings about how that would work and, and what that would show what that could mean. But meanwhile, there were other replications being done mostly by cognitive psychologists who were not convinced with some of these flashy social psychologist findings. And this is important to mention because it, so even though we're all psychologists, there's different areas of psychology in it. So it's at first social psychologists from the beginning felt kind of targeted because it was psychologists from outside social that were doing replications. And so there was this intergroup situation, which is also highly social psychological, where I guess social psychologists, well, I get my group, they kind of just dismiss these out well, these outsiders, they don't know what they're doing. And, and, um, uh, so there was this incident where, yeah, and I mean, this is so public. Um, that um, it was covered fairly well. It, it, it was John Barge's reaction to failed replication of his elderly priming study. And in this study, basically participants who are exposed unknowingly to concepts related to elderly people walk down a hallway leaving the experiment more slowly than a control group of participants who were not exposed to concepts related to the elderly stereotypes such as bingo and uh, Florida and other words. But then several groups, again, from outside of social, they published in plus one, uh, a failed replication, but it was, they had two studies and it, it, the paper was written a bit boldly, but that's common in academia. You want a splashy title, but they were well done and, um, couldn't find the effect and, but then John Barge went kind of on an emotional uh, unhinged diatribe published I think on Discovery Magazine or no, it was a Psychology Today. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to link to as many as these as possible so you can see the source yourself. Um, actually, I think there was a series of posts and the first one he, he removed eventually, because like, maybe he, he had some distance. But, but he basically just attacked the competency of the researchers by saying, well, they didn't do this properly, but he didn't point out specifics, right? And again, it's, he wouldn't really have a case because in cognitive psychology, they tend to have better controls and for other technical reasons we won't get into, well, they, they use within-person designs, typically, which is more possible, easier to do than in social, where you're generally doing between groups, or you're comparing different groups of people put in different situations, which gives you a lot less power to detect anything. So it comes back to the telescope idea. If you have a large telescope, you can see very faint stars. But if you only have a small telescope, 
you can only see very bright stars. So in general, cognitive psychology's telescopes were larger just by the nature of the phenomena they're studying, which is more boring things like memory and categorization and perception. Whereas social psychology, they're studying persuasion and love and romance and uh, racial discrimination and, and a lot juicier things, which is part of the story too. Because the, it, it eventually became clear that, uh, well, I think it was more the social psychologists who started saying, oh, you guys are just jealous with our attention and the importance of our research, right? And so that's why they're attacking us doing these replications. And in fact, they were doing replications because they were skeptical. And that's what a good scientist does. You tr trust but verify if you don't believe something or you're unsure. You do a replication. I mean, it's not anything personal, but somehow because it had never really been done that way, these social psychologists took it personally. And it took a while for the culture to change where, no, 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 like replication is just a normal, healthy part of any healthy science. I want to do more diagrams, maybe a brief um, side digression where I show the characteristics. Oh, and this is the other diagram I meant to show. I oh, don't want to go too. We don't digress from the digression, but maybe uh, just for a second. So this was showing the hyper competitiveness of academia and this i believe is us only but it's it generalizes so you can see the top lines are the number of phd's graduating each year and then the orange line is the number of professor positions and it's uh, something like 40 to 1 40 times more PhDs graduated than our jobs available, right? And so this is a recipe for um, hyper-competitiveness and therefore people having to get closer to the darker edge of, of um, doing shady things. Uh, so let's find the... Uh, This other diagram. Oh dear. So, so here's kind of a summary of the characteristics of the different kinds of science. And, you know, we'll start if you focus on the bottom. For audio only listeners, I'll do my best. So it's there's a continuum from dark to white, and it's like 50 shades of of science. And I purposely chose those colors. Oh, I can use the mouse. Because pseudoscience is dark. I mean, pseudoscience is dangerous. I mean, it kills many people every year who are taking quack medications or other kinds of snake oils, right? And then, and then you go towards science, which is the light. The light can shine a deeper understanding about how the world works. And so if you look at characteristics of pseudoscience, you find uh, confirmation seeking, which is trying to confirm your hypothesis uh, lack of measurement standardization, lack of outside verification, poor standards of evidence, theoretical stagnation, vague and ambiguous language. This is an important one, which basically means unfalsifiable ideas, lack of interest in replication, and belief perseverance despite convincing, disconfirming evidence. So that one, I think, um, 
we can ignore that one. Might have changed position. So in grad school, we were being trained and there was some overlap here, but I'd say it was closer to what's known as a proto-science. Ugh. I think I didn't even push it to program. Okay, well, we can fix that in post. So, yes, from dark to white, we're going from pseudoscience to proto-science, which is kind of, you're getting closer to real science, real cumulative science. So, and in a proto-science, there's some similarities in terms of confirmation seeking and um, and lack of measurement standardization. But at least there's testable hypotheses. Well, I mean, again, 50 shades of testable hypotheses. Selective rigor, this is an interesting one. So there's certain aspects of the research that are rigorous and then other aspects of the research that are not rigorous, which can give you kind of a veneer of real science, but it's, it's kind of a shallow characteristic. And then extremely rare theory falsification and misuse of scientific terms where you're distorting words, distorting the meaning of what a replication even means means and this this is really what i saw um all of these characteristics applied and and so to go from proto-science to a true science at least as popularized by its founders or some of its main founders such as Bra francis bacon robert boyle Karl popper and richard Feynman. Uh, true science uh, requires, absolutely requires replicability, repeatable observations, disconfirmation seeking. So you really seek to, to, to falsify your theory. So falsification as progress, and you subject your hypotheses to violent fal falsification attacks and ruthless skepticism meticulous careful experimentation and meticulous documentation of methods and study details so to allow replication diagnostic replications and to allow uh, falsification of hypotheses where you can actually start eliminating hypotheses and then retaining some and eliminating some but but if all hypotheses are always true, then of course there's no progress. So that's just a, a, a slight digression that helps frame the discussion. And we'll come back to how, just not just the way we were trained and how it conflicted with some of these key characteristics. But then when we got into the pushback, we quickly experienced from status quo researchers, so meaning the more senior or more established researchers started pushing back against transparency and replication. And we can refer back to these characteristics. Um, so, so Barge, John Barge, and to this day, it's a bit unclear what, why was he so upset and why did he come out attacking those replicators' uh, credibility so strongly? And because Replication is, is just a, a way to ensure there's, there's a there there uh, and, and you can build upon previous findings. 
And both, though, though, of course, you can do a replication incorrectly and, and, and screw it up. But Barge was not pointing out specific ways that the replication was flawed. Because if anything, the replication was done more correctly. So, for example, they used a digital automatic time measurement devices rather than a stopwatch with held by the research system. Because if you have research systems that are doing it manually, then you have to make sure that the research systems aren't biasing the results. Because if they know which condition the participant is in, they can be biased towards stopping a bit sooner for the group that's supposed to be walking more slowly. Right? So the experiments were done better. I think used slightly larger sample sizes, like a larger number of participants. And so Barge couldn't really criticize them on anything objectively, so he just criticized their 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 credibility, which is it's it's generally not valid and is known as an ad hominem attack. So that was the first strange story where you started thinking, you know, he had the opportunity to respond differently. He could have said, okay, well, this is a mystery. It appears well done, but maybe there's something to do with the culture or some other kind of boundary condition. Because, yeah, I think that these studies were, were conducted in France or Belgium. And he could have just said, well, this is an open question. We need more research and we need to follow up on this research, right? So that, that was also quite curious that he seemed very emotionally defensive. And, and then later, Dan Gilbert. Uh, well, we could quick, quickly cover that one. Where, so now there was a growing, so that was kind of one of the first more public replication battle, I guess, which were then dubbed as, though I didn't know this at the time, uh, they were dubbed as antagonistic replications, which I guess in, in the, the, the most flattering way to interpret that is it's a situation where, I guess, replicators, or rather researchers, are skeptical of a finding and, and initiate a replication because of that skepticism. Right? And it's, it's true researcher uh, beliefs can influence how a study is designed, but in replication, you have to make sure your study is, is similar enough to the previous study, and you have to make sure that it's, it's, it's well done. And, and, a, and almost by definition, a properly designed study should be immune to the researcher bias. Right? Um, but of course, it's, and, and if anything, it's, it's, that's why it's compelling, because if, if I'm skeptical of something, and but I conduct the study and I actually find the same result, then that boosts the credibility of the research finding because now it's not just the original researcher who might be in that area. So, so they have a vested interest in getting positive results, right? But when a skeptic produces positive results, that's the beauty of science. You have to accept the results, right? Well, unless you... What's the new term now? That's a new low. That, that's only recently. But we can look ahead. Um, pea squashing or null hacking where there's accusations that researchers doing replications are intentionally trying to get null results because they're easier to publish than successful replication results. 
And there is some truth to the fact that uh, though that journals may be less interested in publishing replication results if the same results were found, because then you think, well, I guess we already knew that. But no, that's not how it works. And if anything, most findings are not replicating. Uh, or even at best, if it's 50-50, th that still means a coin toss is just as good predictor as to whether a random finding you pick in, in a random journal or even prestigious journal. Um, so that's another flaw with journals. We'll come back with that. Um, come back to that. So, so yeah, the intention of a replicator uh, shouldn't really matter because again, with the and with sufficient transparency again, and that's and this is part of the story, is that because replications, there was a growing number of people doing replications, including myself, and people were realizing, oh, there's a lot on the line here because especially that most of them and still to this day are negative. And so they can have reputational costs on original researchers. So then the original researchers and journals started requiring higher standards of evidence for replication. And then we turn around, I have a blog post about this and other people said, well, this is nice. This is fine to require high standards for replication, but it should be for all research. And if anything, that's part of the problem. That's why we're in the, this mess to begin with, is that the standards were not high enough. And it kind of worked. I mean, you can't really say, oh, okay, we can't have different standards for different research just because one is replication and the other is not. And actually, if you think about it more deeply, and we might get into this, replication is actually just kind of the proper way of doing science. Replication is not a special thing. It's just a way of repeating and building upon a previous finding in a way where you're not changing too many variables. So that if you get negative results, then uh, it's not just completely wasted experiment. But we'll get back to that. That gets a bit technical. Anyway, so... Um, there was more people doing replications and incidentally, the increased focus on replications increased transparency standards because now the original researchers were saying, well, we want to know those details. We want to know their, we want to look at their data. We want to make sure they did it correctly. Right? So it was brilliant. <laughs> And um, and they didn't have any other choice, right? And it's a correct requirement. So, or it's a justifiable expectation to have of any research. So, that was exciting. And that's also when Curate Science started um, well, no, I just started, Curious Science started around that time. But anyways, later on, we, we realized we needed to develop transparency standards um, and transparency compliance system for any paper, not just replications. So things were getting more heated. There was more replications being published. And then there was a special issue but that doesn't really matter. Um, but the situation involves Simone Schnall, who is still, I believe, at, in the UK somewhere, maybe Cambridge, so something pretty prestigious. And, and she had uh, one of her findings failed to replicate. And uh, and I guess there was a blog post, but again, the, the, the replication study was done way more rigorously with 
like maybe four times the participants. And there was some kerfuffle about, oh, sh should the original author, could, could, should they have had the chance of writing a commentary or something? But it's, it's such a s splitting hairs. And then the replicating team wrote a blog post that was a bit edgy. I think it was something like go big or go home, meaning like do the research well the first time kind of, which it's it's a pretty reasonable position. I mean, replication is expensive. And that's why, again, whenever we publish anything, you should you should be pretty sure that you you're not just publishing a mistake right what which is what is called a, a type one or a false positive error right you just you think you saw something when there was nothing there but of course in science you're calibrating your confidence so it's always like you're a little bit more or less confident about a finding based on how you did the study and how many times you repeated the study but again, in a hyper-competitive environment, there's not really much incentive to be that certain, or that confident. And again, science is not about certainty. So it's actually easy to say, well, someone else is going to clean up after me. Oh, yeah. Our advisor also would specifically say, because often we wanted to do follow-up research, that he would characterize as cleanup research. And he said, well, cleanup research, clean research is important for the field, but you can't do too much cleanup research because then you're not forming a name for yourself and that might be bad for the job market. So that's another example where, what do you mean cleanup research? That's just, that's just called science, right? In terms of figuring out Going deeper and saying, okay, are these effects really there? Do they generalize to other countries, languages, cultures? And then what is what are the mechanisms? So in science, you're always going deeper. You know, you 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 might answer one question, but then answering one question opens up five new questions. So so clean up research again is 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 just a demonstration of the of a corrupted science because th there should be no distinction between i mean maybe we can no there should be distinctions between original research and replication research because i think it, it's true i mean I, i'm not saying that if you only do replication research where you're never testing original hypotheses. I'm not saying that necessarily deserves a professorship position. Uh, but, but there should definitely not go the other way, where only original research counts and, and, and tons of it, you know, like quantity, quantity, quantity. Because to me, if you're discovering that, that many effects, I mean, like just... By definition, you can't understand any of them deeply if you're publishing like 40 papers a year or, or even 20. And this is not even that high. So anyways, there was a reasonable blog post. And then Dan Gilbert went to Twitter, and he's a best-selling Harvard professor who also appears in uh, life insurance commercials because he studies happiness. Well, his best, one of his best-selling books is called Stumbling Upon Happiness, and it's a great book. And, you know, he's a great writer. He's a very smooth, compelling writer. And, you know, that's the truth. But when it comes to his position on replication, his credibility is definitely tarnished. So, um, and I'll just read his tweet. I don't, I don't want to put his face up necessarily. 
so in defense of Simone Schnall, and it's still unclear why he was defending Simone Schnall, other than the fact that they, they could be both be characterized as in kind of social psychology. And I think he did some, it's not as much, but he might have some papers related to social priming because Simone Schnall was also in that area where these subtle manipulations of, oh, let's uh, expose people. I think in the, the, the actual case here, it, it was you expose people to cleanliness related words and then see if that affects their moral judgments about how wrong they think certain things are. And so he came to her defense and tweeted, Psychology's replication police proved to be shameless little bullies. And he, he provides a link to uh, a blog post that Simone Chanel had written, but then there was all these comments where people were attacking her. Again, kind of justifiably, because she was dismissing the replication and, and really splitting hairs on on like some some weird statistical issue that turned out not even even turned out not to even be true. And even if it was true, it, it would still not explain why she was able to get the results and, and the replication team wasn't. And just again, the tone and the, it seemed very uh, defensive and, and dismissive. And um, yeah, and then it got even weirder where, I mean, this this was quite a controversy. It was it was known at the time as the Replicate, like a Replicate scandal, and it happened during one of the largest conferences of the year. And so everyone was talking about it, and and then it it continued on Twitter. So Twitter was not as popular, but it was still the beginning. And it spread fast, and, and the discussion continued on Twitter and in other blog comment sections. And at one point, she, she, she updated her blog post and said that she was going to... She threatened, threatened legal action against anyone who continued to criticize or to publicize her, the failed replications of her work and I saw that and I I took a screenshot and I posted it on Twitter and then within 15 minutes she took it took it down within an hour or something so so someone must have told her no 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 you can't you can't do that right I mean we were just discussing and saying you know why is this causing so much controversy the replications are well done if you feel you know, like you either point out fatal flaws or you redo the experiment to to prove people wrong right she was just making excuses that were not convincing so people naturally just keep piling on and then you're threatening legal action for defamation specifically but defamation doesn't work if you're spreading true facts or just publicly stating true observations. So yeah, that gets weirder. And um, and and yeah, and then so some more personal stories. The so at the time, I was a professor in New Jersey, and one of my grad students was actually studying emotions. And, and by chance, I'm, I'm not making this up, by 
just coincidence of his interest, he wanted to study the embodiment of emotions. That's what it, the area is called, it, which is how do how how does the fact that we have bodies affect our emotions and thought processes? And there's these theories that posit that because our bodies and our minds are are inextricably linked. Uh, our thoughts can affect our body positions, body postures, and conversely, our body postures and our body positions can influence our thoughts and feelings. <laughs> and there's this kind of embodiment <laughs> phenomena, which was which was Simone Schnall's topic in that study, where the idea is, well, if cleanliness, if you feel clean, if you feel cleaner, well, it's also known as the Macbeth effect and a bunch of other failed replications of a paper published in Science. So the idea is if you feel clean, maybe feeling clean will affect your moral judgments about how wrong certain actions are, like eating a dog or killing a puppy, right? And, you know, that's definitely more possible than maybe the elderly priming. But it didn't come out in the replication evidence. Um, so, so by chance, we wanted, he wanted, my grad student wanted to extend her research, build upon it, but, but to do it in a more nuanced way, which at the time my meta theory or my my meta theoretical position was that we need to look at phenomena within person because different people are different and so you can't just average across them blindly like you would be averaging carbon atoms or water particles so he emailed Stamon Schnall and said can i get your stimuli for the materials for this other study because we want to build upon it and it and it'd be it'd be efficient and and better to be able to build upon your stimuli your photos and pictures rather than having to reinvent the wheel she replied saying no i'm not sharing my materials because your advisor me <laughs> your advisor is a prolific replicator who has been, I don't know if she said defaming my work. I could look at the email. And that's it. No, I'm not sharing my materials, which is scientifically questionable, especially when it's there's no valid reason for non-transparency. And she was accusing me of being a prolific replicator and it's true i had done several so-called antagonistic replications but we were in a revolution we, i was just trying to be a role model and say okay this is how you can do replications and we should be doing this routinely i have this other paper i wrote saying there should be a, a social norm where a certain percentage of all your studies every year should be replications of important findings in your own area just like peer review you put you when you submit papers other people need to review your papers, so you should do a, a minimum number of peer reviews per year so that collectively everyone's pitching in. The same with replication. Um, so you see, so, so that's just social, I suffered uh, other social consequences, negative consequences for doing the right thing. Well... That's the dark, one of the many dark achievements of academia. So, so that project got stalled and we had to find other materials and, and spend all this time reinventing the wheel. And, oh yeah, and then two more quick ones. It's already, wow. Uh, 
So in this other case, at a barbecue, yeah, this is a good segue. And this, it was the same friend that we had a falling out on. We were at a barbecue and they were discussing, again, this was so mainstream. Everyone was talking about the replication movement. But this previous friend, he got very animated and said, people's reputations are being damaged and the replicators are not doing enough to, to protect the reputations of the original authors. And which was not even true. And, and it, it, it's the opposite of true. We were bending over backwards. You can go to my website. Um, and I was, I, you know, I, I could show it um, right now. And look at our papers. Oh, actually, I can even show you uh, the uh, curate science. So you can look at my papers. You can go down and, and look at the replication papers one by one. And oh, actually, it would be nicer to do it. Um, with the full screen mode. So you can look at, for example, this was a so-called antagonistic replication. You can read how we talk about the, the failed replication results. And you can, you can see how diplomatic and how careful we were with our conclusions. So oh, here's the, the new replication norm paper. I was talking about. Uh, here's another. Yeah, and this relates to the next story. Very even handed. I mean, if anything, it's overly even handed. It's overly charitable because, again, these, there's a forest fire going raging, a replication crisis forest fire, and it's emotional because it's not just doing replications that are failing all over the place. It's the fact that the people, the only people courageous enough to do the replications are people who were not at the cutting edge of publishing in these glamorous journals because they were more honest. Oh, and there's a great quote about, um, and I wish I had a young Jamie where I could just more quickly switch between these windows. God. And hopefully Brent Roberts is okay with me showing this. Well, that's a public tweet. Um, here you go. <laughs> so Brent Roberts at the University of Illinois uh, had this great quote, a uh, tweet, which said, failure to replicate hurting your career. What about PhDs with no career because they were honest, right? And this, this was the elephant in the room here. Um, and here I'm at this barbecue trying to have fun on a nice summer day. And this previous friend is literally, he got right up to my face and was yelling, you're not doing enough to protect the reputation of original authors. Because I was saying, no, we're doing more than enough. Did you read how we wrote? read sorry how we wrote the replication papers you it's it's like it was just so weird it was like paul you're so wrong here and like you're blaming the victim like we're not we're not the uh the culprit i mean we're not the perpetrator <laughs> We're the victim. Anyways, it was just very strange. And um, and he got a lot of slack for this. I mean, it only says four ret retweets. But Twitter was smaller back then. And this might have been right when he posted it. Like, it got way more than that. Oh, dear. So, um, 
let's go back here. So the it just goes on and on. And the ironies and the levels of, of twistedness in these stories where you have like social psychologists being so biased and it became tribal. It became very tribal, like, oh, the replicators and the original authors. And it's like, no, we're all supposed to be scientists working on the common goal of pursuing the truth, not slinging mud at each other like childish junior high schoolers. Um, but I guess there was a lot on the line and there was more. So in my own admission, I, I underestimated what was on the line here, people's reputations. Because, I mean, I was never powerful like that. Um, so I had a lot less to lose. And even though I could, you know, it, it's it's a perspective asymmetry thing. Um, but for me, most of these people were established researchers that have tenure. So why would it hurt that much for few failed replications? Right? And we totally underestimated the extent of pushback that we would get from doing the simple act of replication and demanding transparency or higher transparency. And so the last, oh no, two more studies, uh, stories, is at this other conference, I think the following year, so now we're Well, this doesn't matter. It's closer to... Replicate was 2014. Um, so, oh yeah, so it's this paper here. Big Secrets. Uh, let's go back here. So this is another embodiment idea where previous research had showed that um, writing about big secrets that you are concealing can weigh you down like an emotional burden <laughs> so much so that it makes you perceive hills as steeper <laughs> and this sounds wacky but it it does make sense because it was based on well some sense it was based on previous research that is more credible where participants had to wear, yeah, this is a good example. They had to wear a really heavy backpack. And this was on campus, like outdoors. And then they had to look at a hill and, and just estimate how steep they thought the hill was. And what they found, though probably not that large an effect, but they found that on average, if you're wearing a heavier backpack, you perceive the hill as, as, as steeper. And that this could make sense in terms of evolutionary pressures because yeah you don't want to when you're scavenging for food or something like you don't want to it's better to to overestimate how much energy it'll take to climb that mountain to you know kill that goat rather than underestimating something like that anyways so but this research was just building off of that and saying oh this might even apply like the heavy backpack are big secrets because when you're hiding big secrets from people, it it's kind of like this emotional burden, right? I mean, it, it, there's all these expressions. So a lot of this embodiment stuff, it even comes just from language and, and the way we speak. So it kind of makes sense, but the samples were small, sample sizes, and it was done online. And it was just like, no, I don't, I don't buy it. Let's just do this. And it's online, so it'll be more compelling because there's fewer moving parts. Because we could sample from the same population, which was the U.S. So you're reducing the number of alternative kind of uh, conditions or differences. <clears throat> and... Uh, so my co-author was presenting the results at a poster, sh poster session. And in academic conferences, there's usually main talks, which are by more established professors. The one 
that Dietrich Stapel was jealous about not getting the largest room where the keynote famous professors are talking. And so you either have talks or small room talks or poster sessions where you just put a poster up your results and it's generally for grad students or postdocs, some professors. But anyways, and all out of nowhere, this guy just barges in kind of and says, you know, what are you guys doing? You know, why, why are you trying to replicate this research? And, and he, right away, he was very confrontational, very kind of in your personal space. And he wasn't a big person, but definitely more robust than me. And... And yeah, he was attack, attack, attack. And his, but again, he wasn't talking about, he wasn't actually saying, oh, you did this wrong or this wrong. Or he was being emotional and saying, well, this, like, why are you doing this replication research if you're not, will, like, you're not interested in, in following it up? And why don't you find, What's called boundary conditions, where the effects to uh, emerge, and actually that was part of the peer review. They invited the original author, and he said the same thing. It's like, well, no, no, these are not replications. They're more like it's just showing the effects are not generalizable, and your job should be to show under which conditions they they operate and can be observed. And it's like, no, no, that's not our job. You make the claim. That's not how it works. Uh, sorry. When you publish a paper, you make a claim and the onus is on you. If other people can't, uh, and they do it well, again, the onus is on you to point out what the mistakes are and to, to show the boundary conditions. It's not my, it's not the replicator's job to figure out, like it's possible, of course it is possible that it would be replicable under different conditions, but th there's hundreds, thousands of conditions, right? Um, so again, this, this, this kind of asymmetry between standards of evidence, uh, I think Andrew Gelman has a, a name for this called a time reversal heuristic, where somehow like scientists think, oh, because the evidence came after it, like evidence that comes prior has somehow more weight than evidence that comes later which which actually doesn't make sense but of course it's it's self-serving for the original authors and established authors to believe that so it's maybe just one other way that original authors were deceiving themselves without even bad any bad intent i mean they look it looks it makes them look uh Anyways, it, it, it's embarrassing in retrospect, but I'm trying to say again, trying to back, bend over backwards to give them to be charitable and generous. Uh, there's all these ways, and, I, and actually I've admitted stuff as well, where there was ways that, in which we were biased um, in doing the replications. And it's, I think it is true that I was kind of antagonistically going after effects which i didn't believe and at the time i was seeing more of myself as oh i'm doing this altru altruistically for the cause so i i was deceiving myself as well in other ways anyway so so that was very um traumatizing i mean not not i mean i don't want to over dramatize but there was a physical tension there and you know, I did feel whoa, you know, when and um, and you know, he did pull back a bit and got a bit friendlier when I explained that no, no, replication is, is just part of a healthy science. I'm writing a blog post, actually, yeah, and that's what led to um, this. And he said, Well, what do you mean? Why a blog post? Just publish it in a paper right 
So actually, he's the reason that this became a, a paper rather than a blog post. And I was saying, well, everyone should be doing replications. Replication is not an, anti, an antagonistic thing. Um, but then the original author emailed me apologizing for his friends kind of aggressive physical confrontation but the email was weird it it it, it was almost too friendly and nice but i'm not going to get into that one that that's you know Well, yeah, maybe later. There's other side stories that I, I don't want to get into that get even darker. So his last story, wow, this is... This was at a different conference, but around the same time. And I'm just talking to other... Oh, yeah, we were supposed to get to that. Congratulatory. It was a very positive moment where a journal editor had just announced that they were going to raise transparency standards. And in part, it was because of an initiative that I was part of, that I led, called psychdisclosure.org. And, and we'll get to that, but shortly. And I'm just talking to other transparency people and, and replication mavericks and then this lady just kind of barges in again and, and says hey like you know like and this I don't have on record I wish I did um, but she kind of couched it as positive or start as part of like, well, you know, replication is important, but uh, I'm kind of concerned with with the way you write about replication uh, in your blogs, because I was uh, I was more active in my blog, prove yourself wrong, WordPress blog, and again, I was just so confused because to me, from my perspective. And again, you can, I was just there. You can, uh, you can read for yourself. Uh, and close that. So here's an example where I even have disclaimers where Oh, not that one. Uh, but it's pretty measured language, very moderate uh, language. And this person was ex accusing me of, of being judgmental and, and uh, kind of unfair to people. But, but it was just so strange because I was doing, in my mind, I was doing the direct opposite of that. I was bending over backwards to be generous and polite and respectful more than than I should have been. And I had other people telling me exactly that, that I was being too pol polite and too charitable. And I would say, well, I know, deep down, I'm upset and angry and emotionally distraught, but I'm trying to set a, a, a role model because it'll help accelerate the movement if we can publish and write about these things in more sober, even-handed ways, um, right? So it's, but it's another example of heterogeneity where different people experiencing the same situation will have very different experiences of that same situation, right? <laughs> depending on your position, depending on your goals. So of course she was assistant or maybe even tenured professor and i mean at the time i was a professor first year professor 
right? But but given I was in the transparency and replication movement, I mean, I had made sacrifices and I decided, well, I'm going to take a, a career risk here because I, I'm definitely uh, created a lot of enemies. And um, anyways, so... So then I responded like, well, I don't, I don't think you have a case. I mean, I can, at first I think I was just, I was so shocked. I didn't even know what to say. And then I said, well, I just said I wasn't convinced. Oh yeah. And I even remembered saying, well, in science, this is how it works. And then she literally interrupted me and was saying, see, you're doing it right now. <laughs> And I was like, "What doing what? I'm just explaining that in science, high standards of evidence and replication are crucial. Like, what am I doing wrong? Like, she was literally like, is, is, am I not allowed to say that? Or like, what's wrong with saying that? If there's something wrong, tell me what I just said wrong. Don't tell me that it's wrong to say something without telling me why. You know, it was just, oh, my God. So I was literally not just being attacked online, uh, over email, even by my own advisor. I was being attacked at conferences and even physically, like near physical altercations. And I'm not a violent person. Uh, if anything, I used to play hockey and, and part of the problem is that I was insufficiently violent to be an effective hockey player growing up in Canada. And there was even a case where someone was punching me and I still didn't re reciprocate. Um, and I mean, I guess I, I could be, I, I'm a very intense person and I can be, uh, I mean, I love play fighting and, and so I can be violent in other ways, but um, it was just very strange. So let's move on here and try to wrap up. But there's just so many stories and I, I could go on. Um, so again, the, the general trend here is we experienced tons of pushback and it wasn't just me, right? I mean, and, <clears throat> and the more general theme was that <clears throat> it was already pretty dark to realize uh, what Daryl Bem's bomb meant for the field of psychology, but <clears throat> Excuse me, but the pushback against transparency and replication was actually even worse, right? Because again, there were other ways for the field and for the senior researchers to react that would have been much more mature, much more professional, and they chose not to act that way. So it went from the most serious crisis in psychology to kind of like a unfathomable dark period. But still, we just kept going, just, you know, plow ahead. And um, right, so I think I'll just discuss. Oh, yeah. And then meanwhile, so I want to end on positive, but meanwhile, there was several other fraud cases that, that rocked social psychology. Uh, and so one was Smeesters in, in, again in the Netherlands. In, uh, and this was almost back to back in summer 2000. Oh, this, so we're going back a little bit. Summer 2012. Um, and Smeesters was a social psychologist, but he was working at a business school, which is another kind of dirty secret that a lot of social psychologists go to business school because they pay uh, much more higher salary. And let's go back there. And the other case was in the U.S., Lawrence Sanna, also a social psychologist, University of Michigan, prestigious. And we still don't really know much of what happened there. And we'll come back to 
fraud investigation procedures and how there has to be standards there. Because again, universities either don't cooperate or actively interfere with investigations and then are not even transparent about the results and what they did, what they changed in the workplace to minimize fraud from happening in the future. I mean, this is disgusting. Um, and, uh, and then it should also be mentioned that this is in... So again, we have Stapel in fall of 2011, which is one of the biggest fraud cases in history of modern science. Now we have two other ones in social psychology in 2012. And this is on the heels of another case at Harvard by a female, uh, Ruggiero, who was a social psychologist. And Mark Hauser in the mid 2000s also had at Harvard, but he was more of an animal psychologist studying monkeys. That's some serious, that's some dark monkeying around. And then another case in 2015, later on, Forster, uh, in, who's Dutch, but was working in Germany. I mean, it's just, but again, if you now looking back, it, it it's, it's, it was, I guess, very tempting. The stakes are so high, transparency is so low, no replication culture. But anyways, that's just, I uh, wanted to mention that this is, so there was all this exciting transparency replication movements, but then there was this dark, pushback and simultaneously other cases of fraud just kept emerging where people were just like oh my god can we just not talk about fraud for a whole year maybe <laughs> so social psychology was particularly battered and it's still embattled and it's still an ongoing crisis well more broadly but the worst of it focused on social psychology and it's you know, it's still unclear why things would be worse than social psychology. But my theory is that it, it, it studies topics that are more sexy. Literally, they, it, we, they study sex and romance and mate preferences and mating strategies. I mean, it literally gets sexy and steamy. And this is what the public wants to know. So there's actually even higher stakes. So if you're a social psychologist, you're studying topics that are more in demand that could more likely get lead to a best-selling book or a viral TED talk. So it would make sense to have more problems and more fraud because the stakes are higher, right? So this, this, the stakes are higher and it's the same low accountability, right? But if you're going to compare it to cognitive psychology, Cog the stakes are lower in cognitive psychology because you're not, it could be a lot harder. There's exceptions like unconscious priming or unconscious semantic priming. But so that's, that's not really a theory. That's just kind of reason. And, um, but so, Part of the excitement, though, was that in, so during my postdoc, I decided there was this, actually, I can maybe bring it up. There was this initiative by Simmons, Simonson, and Nelson called the 21-word disclosure, and it was basically a 21-word sentence that basically says, I've disclosed all tested conditions, exclusions, measures, and how I determine sample size. And... It's um, it's it it was a great initiative, and the idea was well, if you're being more transparent, then you just tell the world in your paper. And I thought, wow, what a what a great idea! But I want to spread the idea so that it catches on. So here's. Kind of uh, 
from their they published the APS magazine observer article where it showed you well in the food world we have kind of transparency in the sense of nutritional labels so you can know what's in your food but in psychology somehow this is this is the leading journal that published the Daryl Bem ESP paper. Uh, it, somehow in, in, in research, we don't even have those simple facts labeled anywhere on a paper. So I thought it was a great idea. And so we just decided, well, let's try to spread the idea and, and just ask thousands of people by email, you know, have you disclosed these things in your paper? And um, And then, um, I shall just go back to here. <laughs> if so, what are the details? And then we just posted it on a website. And we're just, and, and there was many motivations for doing this. Where is this? Oh, many motivations. But the, yeah. The main one, I mean, I was just really curious, like, how bad can it really be? Because these four details, where is it? I should use a filter. So here, so, and then we wrote a paper about our results. And, um, but these are basic pieces of information. So it's, so again, the expectation, while well, you ask people for this information, most of them should give it to you. And, and we did get basically 52% of people, uh, or almost, uh, basically 50% who did respond and said, yeah, yeah, I've disclosed those pieces of information in the paper, or if not, here they are, right? And And so that was the positive news, but there was also tons of people. Well, no, I shouldn't say tons. Uh, there was, you know, six to seven individuals and groups who emailed us who were not happy and some of them angry that we were asking these questions. And, but again, the vast majority were okay with it. And actually, there was probably, 10 times more positive emails saying, wow, this is really important. We all need to do this. Journalists should do this, require this. But, you know, the negative ones, they sting more than the positive, right? And when you look at the nature of these, again, they're just splitting hairs or attacking you at your integrity. And, you know, it kind of hurt at the time, but it was also kind of exciting. And I had a team of people, like this was a team effort, as you can see from the co-authors. Um, anyways, uh, we're out of time. So the take home was again, it, you know, you can have a different opinions, that's fine. But when you look at the emotional defensiveness of these, the, the pushback of like, are you really against transparency? Like how, how is this possible? I mean, I could read some of these emails, but I don't want to get too personal though. You, though really these people should be, um, held accountable, I guess. But um, the details, you know, it, it, it's... Again, it's... They were really, really working hard. I guess that was kind of the conclusion, is that, well, they got to be hiding something. If you're working that hard on writing long emails <laughs> against something that the silent majority at least seemed to uh, 
be celebrating. And again, why is there this big polarization of, again, 10, there was 10 times more people saying, this is amazing, this is so groundbreaking and important. And then, like, so let's say like about 50 of those people, and then like about five to six people sending borderline hate mail saying like, you know, how did you get ethics for this? This is unethical. It's unethical to ask questions about transparency of scientific papers. Literally. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so, but the positive is that the success of our website, psychdisclosure.org, inspired psych science, the leading empirical journal in psychology, to do their own pilot, and they basically replicated our results. Um, so much so that they decided to change journal policy and starting January 1st, 2014, all papers at um, Psych Science were required to disclose those four pieces of information, which are crucial to interpret a paper, but had never been required to before. And this sounds minor, but it's... It's not because psychologically there's a big difference between a sin of omission versus a sin of commission because omission is, is kind of like a white lie. You're just leaving things out, right? But it's not like you're actively contradicting the truth. You're just leaving things out. And so again, in a high stake, high co competition environment, these differences really make, really matter. And, um, So, oh yeah, I was trying to show, <sighs> and and so and now we on Curate Science we have uh, that's one of the reporting standards. So this is probably too small, um, but it says this article complies with the basic four at submission psych science reporting standard, and that's the year that. It started and it's still going on today. So now all else being equal, papers from psych science are slightly more transparent, but we'll come back to what that means in terms of actual standards and what kind of minimum standards we should be expecting. Okay, so let's wrap up. Um, And and that was a celebration. I mean, that, that's still probably one of um, well. Anyways, it was a proud moment to to achievement to because it was courageous. Yes, this is what I was trying to say. Um, all my professors and most people uh, within the academy were telling me, "No, no, you should not do this. You're a postdoc. You're you're you're." In, applying for jobs you're gonna be part of this contentious transparency movement you're gonna hurt your chances of a career you're gonna be throwing people under the bus i was even told by uh, my postdoc advisor and i i said well those are valid concerns but you only live once and i live by scientific principles and i'll figure it out whatever happens I know I'm on the right side of history, so I'm willing to stick my neck out and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and that's part of the story. We'll see what happens. Um, but as a teaser, uh, things will get darker <laughs> and uh, we'll see even more pushback that becomes even more surreal and um, and so just a brief uh, recap is that again it was an exciting time probably one of the most exciting times to be a psychologist in that early hustle and bustle 
of the replication movement post BEM around 2011, 2012, and all these things were happening. But, but the positive mood was quickly dampened by more fraud cases and by a growing pushback by the elite senior established professors and and even though the silent majority and this still goes on today i mean most people are on board but most people don't have the power that the one percent or the five percent of the elite professors who still are in charge of being editors at the most important journal. They're still in charge of uh, hiring at universities and even reviewing grants at the funding agencies. So it's just so frustrating that we've made so much progress, well, in some ways, though there's still lots of work to be done. But yes, but yet in terms of the power structures, and I'm not talking about radical social justice power structures, I'm talking about objective well <laughs> with all due respect but i'm talking about actual <clears throat> power that <clears throat> professors still have and they are their reputation is either in question or has been tarnished yet most of them are still holding their position of power which comes back to the accountability of at universities and how there, there's, there's not really a system to ensure that professors are acting with integrity, which is why we propose this kind of Hippocratic oath for scientists. Just like for medical doctors, they have to kind of take an oath to do no wrong and have the highest integrity. Uh, that's what we propose. We need to, a Hippocratic oath for scientists and minimum transparency standard. And that would go a really long way to improve the situation. Okay, till next time.